Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. This is going to be a good one today. Amina Peterson is here. Uh, she is a healer, an intimacy coach, a sex doula, a tantric sex educator, a somatic body worker. I purposefully, Amina, put all these in the intro because I wanted the people to know that you are all these things. She's also a sexual revolutionary and an activist. Her retreat at Imaloa is November 6 to 11, 2023. Amina, I'm really happy to have this conversation, honey. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Jake. I'm really excited to chat with you. One of the things that I learned from when you came to Imaloa is that you normally do uh, 150 plus person events. And for Imaloa, you're obviously having to scale that back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I am trying to wrap my head around what a 150 person retreat on sex and sexuality looks like. What? Ex how do you, that is just, it's so much to hold. It's so much space to hold. Can you share a little bit about what that experience is like? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I understand because I'm actually trying to unwrap my head around it and, and not doing it again. So <laughs> I am grateful that Imaloa exists and was able to like tell me to scale it back a bit. Um, but it, it, you know, it looks, it, they were seven day events and everyone's on site. And so we basically create a village for seven days. Uh, and in that village, there's opportunities to learn and there's space to hide. I remember at the end of one event, I saw someone on the property and I'm like, oh, did you just check in? Cause I haven't seen you all week. And so you must be coming cause we're leaving. Our groups were transitioning at this retreat center. And she was like, no, I just, I came to the first event and I realized it was too much. And so I just pretty much just hung out by the pool and in my room. And I haven't been to any of the workshops, but I'm really grateful that I have this time for a rest. I imagine you don't, you don't take that personally though. I imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely not. Because I want people to manage their comfort and like know that we're here if you want to say something, but to not feel I feel like we're pressured to just show up in ways that don't feel good every day in life. I want to create a space and I'm always working to create a space where that is not our reality anymore, at least for a few days or a week or something where you get to say, you know, actually, I know I signed up for this, but I'm going to do it this way because this is what feels good for me. And that's at the crux of embodiment, right? Like that's embodiment. This is what I'm feeling. And so I'm going to move according to this feeling and not like according to what Amina said, you're supposed to do. Um, so yeah, so it's it's what it what it's what happened. But it's they're big, they're these big communities that we have workshops and classes. And it's funny because you never feel like every you don't feel a hundred people at once. You get 60 people that show up to a workshop, and then the rest are at the pool, or some have gone on excursions, and or some are in their in their in their love shacks doing their own thing <laughs> so it's <laughs> it creates space for all of that love shack baby don't make me sing i will i know it's going in my head too <laughs> i cannot tell you how grateful i am at Imaloa to be able to be more choosy about the host that we have and mm. how many sex sexuality and sensuality retreats we've been pitched i personally have been pitched and others and it's interesting because Imalo is for this advancement and education of human beings. And it feels like so much of sex and sexuality and the conversation around it is what we didn't get as young human beings. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that you're just so goddamn normal <laughs> and, and the, the, how you show up. And it's a big reason. I mean, obviously, you know, you found out about Imalo through a mutual friend of ours. But so many people that pitch us or talk to us about sex or sexuality retreats feel unresolved in their pitch. They themselves are working through something. And I, I find, and I could be judgmental Judy over here, I find mm -hmm. that's really dangerous. I feel like you have to have gotten to the other side of something. And I don't know, because I'm not on the other side of it. So I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, extend my hand and ask you to tell me a little bit about your journey, Amina. But yeah. you just seem like you've actually done the work that has allowed you to hold the space where mm -hmm. many, many, many others haven't. Right. Yeah. I think that's common in the healing world and the sex healing is no different, right? Like we reach a point where we're like, I'm all 
tribe and I'm a guru. And it's just ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and we're learning new language as a society that's constantly changing around ideas around gender and sexuality and sex and what that looks like. We have all, you know, we have all of these letters after, I mean, I'm a baby, I'm a 70s child. So we had LGBT and then Q and then, and now it's gone, right? But we have to learn all this language. And so just like we have to learn that language, there's all this other stuff that we have to continue to learn. Different ways in which our bodies experience sexual trauma that don't look like you know, there's some boogeyman jumping out the bushes, but all the little things that we are, that shape us in our lives. And I think a lot of, a lot of times we, we're not looking at that as significant or relevant in, in this field, in the field of sex and sexuality. And that I feel like is a big chunk of the lack of resolvement. Like, it's like, oh, I think I know this, so that we're just going to go with this. And um, I spend half my year in class and I have been doing this for over 20 years and I'm still going to teachers and still learning and still studying. Like I, this is not, I, you don't get to be the guru and just arrive. I'm listen, sorry. Listen, yeah. <laughs> this is, I'm finding through lines in all these different conversations that we're having with retreat hosts, because I think that while this is about your retreat, I think a lot of retreat hosts and transformational leaders are, who, who want to get to a certain level, maybe 150 person retreats, I mean, a Peterson, but they don't, they don't realize the work that you're doing to get into it. And that, that, that spending half your year in class, like, hello, people wonder why people like you are successful. Hello, half your year in class. That's, right. that's a, that's a profound statement. I appreciate that about you. Well, thank you. And I think it, I think it shows up in the work. I think one of the things I noticed immediately at Imaloa was how much you were investing back in the business. Mm -hmm. And that is it. I am the business. I have to invest back into this building in the same way that you're investing into, the, the, you know, Bali House number one and two. Like we gotta, we gotta make sure that that there's no leaks. <laughs> we gotta make sure that it's up to date. Like all of that is a part of a part of the business model of healing. And I think sometimes we just, you know, that that gets pushed aside in the money in the money game in the money chase. And and um, and I get it. Like I'm not completely anti-capitalist, you know, uh, we, I'm a, I have a business where I'm making money and I get it that money is a part of how we survive. And without that, we have all kinds of other root chakra issues and finding that balance that allows you to, um, to grow and to in that growth, be able to hold that space like that. You have to grow with the space you're holding. And so that's really a big part of of the, you know, like my journey and where I'm at, I'm constantly trying to grow with the space that I'm holding mm. and that space is constantly evolving. And so I can't sit in the corner and, and act like I'm not going to evolve with it. It just won't work. You can only take others as far as you yourself are willing to go is something that we say at MLO and why, it's why the personal and professional development for our team is so important. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard you say wellness. No, I've heard you say healing, not wellness. I was thinking of wellness mm -hmm. with healing. I've heard you say healing. And yet when I think of sex and sexuality retreats and how taboo it probably is for many um, to think about that and people watching or listening must be like, what happens there? Is right. Are your retreats about more exploration or more healing? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And both. <laughs> <laughs> and both. Um, so it's funny. There's a, there's a component of it that is exploratory. Like I want you to come in and be as curious as possible. And then I want to feed those curiosities. And I think that that, oh, I don't, I don't think I'm going to erase that. I know for a fact that healing happens when our curiosities are able to blossom and we're able to move. We're humans, we're curious by nature. And anytime we shut down a part of who we are, we are in the, go moving in the opposite direction of wellness, mm. right? Like if I have to hide a part of me or if I have to disregard or ignore a part of me um, and in hopes to belong and hopes to have connection, then I'm actually moving away towards my wellness away from my wellness. And, um, and so this, my retreats offer an opportunity for you to actually 
show up. I use the word wholeness, right? Show up in your wholeness. And like, that's what we're striving for. We're striving for wholeness. Like all parts of me are lovable. All parts of me are, are acceptable. All parts of me are able to be shared. And where is that space where I get to show up and all that's true? And that's what we're doing at Even Loa. Healing, right, healing happens when you're curious. That is so profound. Because I think, anyways, this doesn't matter what I think, but healing happens when you're curious. And I wonder if the opposite of healing happens when you're not curious, when you when you shut down. And mm -hmm. um, when did this vision for you of being a sex, uh, uh, I was going to say a sex host. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to think of the actual <laughs> titles. I know you're not the, uh, hosting these sex and sexuality and sensuality retreats. When did was what, what did you want to be when you were a kid, for example? Hmm. That's a good question. I want I'm an Aquarius. So I wanted to be so many things when I was a kid. And my mom was one of those, you could be whatever you want. And so it just changed all the time. Um, I wanted to be a geologist, an anthropologist. I loved my, my first name is Crystal. And I, I just like was supposed to work with crystals. That's what I was, that's what I thought by the time I found out that crystals had powers. And so, so I've always like just been on this path of like discovery and trying to find things that felt good for me. And what that always ended up landing me in was activism. Always ended me landing in a space where I'm like, well, somebody's telling me I can't do this or somebody's telling somebody they can't do whatever it is, be, be who they are, whatever. And they need a defender then because my mommy said <laughs> we could be whatever we want. And so I ended up in that space where I was just, um, I'm constantly working in, in, in as a social justice warrior, and um, and that doesn't pay well. <laughs> social justice nonprofits don't pay well, and so I um, had an opportunity to take on a very well-paying side gig as a sex surrogate uh, in the '90s. What is a and sex surrogate, and what was that like in the '90s? Right. Good questions. Um, there was uh, a sex surrogate. I was working under Dr. Dean Dow, who uh, was at the time considered the father of sex surrogacy. It's now called surrogate partnership. And basically what um, he was, he had a, a psychotherapy practice in Chicago on uh, on Lakeshore Drive. It was like the fanciest thing I'd ever done in my life. I was <laughs> And I had to take the elevator all the way up to this fancy building on the lake. And it was like a whole Oprah lift, two doors down, two buildings down. And I was like, I am, I am over here in the fancy things. Um, and and it was, and then it was terrifying because it was me working with the with with a team of psychotherapists who were working with people coming back into sexual experiences from PTSD and trauma. Wow. And so the surrogate does just what a surrogate sounds like, right? I, I was available for sexual practice with them under the supervision of the therapist. Um, and so we, I, uh, as an example, I had a client that had been in the first Gulf War and had developed severe PTSD and couldn't be touched, was, was afraid to be touched, was afraid that his reaction would, um, would harm his wife. And so he had shut down sexually and was seeing Dr. Dean Dow to help assist that. And when they get to a certain point where they're ready to start practicing um, some levels of intimacy, I, as a surrogate, would show up in that space. As an oh example. Oh, my gosh. So when you <laughs> found out about this as a possible job opportunity, because you said that activism doesn't pay, being real honest, real authentic, was it just a way to be able to earn money at first? Like you weren't thinking yes. this is like, yeah, this was, and you probably earned some good money. Oh my God. It paid so good. This was the nineties. Okay. I would pay 300 bucks an hour. Wow. I did. I, and I was 19. I didn't have any bills. <laughs> so yeah, life was great. Um, and I, I did it because the money. There was no other, I had no other connection. My mother did not talk about sex. We didn't have sex air that was productive or useful. I was not sexually liberated. I just also wasn't sexually like scared. Um, I was queer. I identified as queer already. And um, what did and queer so mean in the nineties versus what it means today? Has it changed? 
That's a good question. Uh, I was bisexual, which in the nineties for me meant quietly sleeping with men while I <laughs> slept with women because you wouldn't date a woman if they found out you were bi. <laughs> and so now I can say I was queer. If you asked me then, I would have said I was a lesbian, but my actual behavior was bisexual. Um, so, <laughs> right. uh, and I, it was the gay nineties, right? It was, it was, and I was in Chicago, the home of house music and, and Boys Town and all things fun. Um, and I didn't want to leave that culture either. And I saw this was work that I did totally secretly. I kept my job in social justice. You didn't tell anybody? Did, no one. I didn't talk about this for like until 10 years later, actually. Like it was a long time. I, I It was a, a long time past before I actually felt safe enough to even say that I was a sex worker, even though it was legal and under a physician's office, <laughs> like it's still, there was a lot of shame around it. For so me. you had shame in doing this work. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. This is so fascinating. To, this is why I don't read bios before I have conversations. Cause I just want to be fully present with people. I want to, I want to, I want to be fully, I'm just so grateful that you're sharing so openly. So I'm curious, what was the spectrum? You said a sex worker, what was the spectrum of, uh, experience? In other words, you talked about the Iraqi vet who was afraid of touch and what he would do to his wife. Was that, so was that learning to be intimate? Could that go, like, what was the spectrum of, do you understand what I'm saying? Like the experience? Yeah, like absolutely. absolutely. Penetration, so now, like what did it get down to? Was it all of the above? It, it could have gotten as deep with that client as penetration. Um, the, the, at the point that we worked up to, he wasn't able to maintain an erection. Oh. And, and so that wasn't a possibility for him at the time. See, now I teach soft penis entry and so it's different, but now I know better. Um, but at the time <laughs> that wasn't something that was available uh, for me. I didn't, I wasn't resourced in that. Um, but it was a lot of touch. Um, now what I know and call cuddle therapy was a big part of it. Like that closeness, that intimacy, that space to be able to talk and communicate. Um, it was, uh, we, we did touch genitals. So it was genital stimulation and just like testing the waters, right? Each each session. Uh, I also worked with folks who um, were, uh, well, I had a client that didn't have full sensation. He had an accident and had spinal cord injury. He didn't have full sensation in his body. And so he had sexual shame and um, issues around that, that he was working through with the therapist and then to be in a space where he did not have a partner to practice with, which is oftentimes, I think one of the, to me, one of the standouts of surrogacy work is that for people who are going to talk therapy and learning these things that, well, where do you practice if you're not partnered? What are you supposed to do in a world that says, well, you know, you can't hire a sex worker and you can't do this and you can't do that and you got to do this and that's not available to you. How do you get to the point where you can actually actualize your healing because otherwise it's all theory it's all you know i think this will work when i get some but i don't know and so um and so yeah so there's a range of of ways in which surrogacy shows up and i now train and coach surrogates um around you know ways to show up for folks in in that in in the in their healing and um but it was definitely just a it was a lot for me and at the time i didn't last long i only lasted I last less than a year um because i had so much shame and guilt around my own issues i didn't you know i didn't i wasn't even scratching the surface of like who i was and i was a baby mm -hmm. <laughs> um and so I remember like ghosting a couple times, like I'm not showing up to this. I can't do this anymore. And then the doctor would call me in and we'd sit and we'd have a meeting and we'd be back to normal. And then after a couple of times that I was like, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. Mm. Did it and allow you to start? I'm curious that that's such a, that's such a weird age to be working in that capacity and yet totally honorable. Did it start developing certain aspects of your own compassion or even curiosity for the work that it ultimately led you into? Absolutely. Like that, I always say that's, I start with that because that's the root of my curiosity. Up until that point, sex was something that you did and didn't tell your parents. <laughs> that was about all I had. Um, <laughs> and then like, you know, if you're had, if you're heterosexual babies probably will come and that's what we got. You could, it was the nineties. So you could die. 
right? Like that was, that was our messaging around sex. And then I go to this space where there's like, now there's actually medical stuff around sex, right? Like this was, nobody had taught about Masters and Johnson when I was in high school or in college. And I was, I was going to university. I was in a sociology program. And even in our women's studies program, this was not something that was being discussed. Sex and pleasure and our ability to experience it and what it's like to not have that as an option. What is what it what becomes of you when such a big part of who you are as a human, as the way that we're created, is no longer available to you? Like sexual pleasure is not available. Mm. How does that impact who you are? Like that's it's huge. And so that that just turned me on to like the possibility of learning more. Um, and then, you know, I just that continued. That continued uh and Eventually, it fed this where I'm at today. Um, over over the course of years, I ended up going to massage school and studying under a teacher that was um, that had taught at Esalen Institute in Big Sur. And uh, I learned that Esalen was a thing, and that I could touch people like that. And so then I started playing around with like sensual touch and like what that could look like. And then that just opened up because then I learned the word Tantra and I was like, well, what's that? <laughs> what is that Eastern Asian word practice experience being? Yeah. yeah. That's cool. This is beautiful. I think that's so inspirational that when you just, I don't know, when you just, it reminds me of being in my late teens, early twenties, and just the explorations that you go down if you just allow yourself to do it. And and I see also now when you talk about pleasure being medicine, that this is literally, that's literally how you were, how, how you came about. Like that was your coming of age is learning that pleasure could be medicine. Um, and I know that you've also said that we should know more about our bodies before we do anything else. Yet for me, and I know many others, I imagine, um, we learned to learn about everything else, subjects in schools, culture, uh, relationships, everything external, and and put our bodies last. Um, right. I, I wonder, yeah, what you, what have, what have you learned and what do people who come to your retreats learn by putting their bodies first? Mm, yeah, I... Um... I have to tell you, like, I'm still really upset about the whole thing, but we um, we dissected frogs in, like, eighth grade. Like, I think about how like, in our biology class, that was a requirement. And, like, some people were able to get out as conscientious objectors, but my mom was not signing that note. She just made us do it. But I bring that up, and, like, we were dissecting another animal to learn about their biology. Like that, it's the most bizarre thing to me that that is a, that is accepted as normal and they're still doing it. That we are dissecting other animals instead of showing young people cadavers and body parts. Like we have no idea about our body parts. I taught a class recently and I mentioned the uh, autonomic nervous system and I just saw I had to stop and pause and go back and and teach basics about how our nervous system responds. And these were all college educated people who just, where were they supposed to get this information? Hmm. And that impacts our sex, that impacts our ability to connect with people. Um, folks that say they have an aversion to touch or and in a, or not say folks that actually have an aversion to touch or an aversion to connection, um, folks that ha that struggle with these things, those are oftentimes nervous system responses that have said, well, you're, this is, has, has not been safe for you, so we're not going to do that. And like people don't realize, oh, something's wrong with me. And it's when we start actually learning, which is what I really try to make as a key part of, of my program is that like, you get to learn like what that sensation, you get to learn first that you're, you have a sensation, right? It's like, Hey Jake, how you doing? I'm fine. What does that mean? <laughs> what are the sensations? Like, how are you really doing? What are the sensations that you're feeling in your body right now? What emotions are coming up or what emotions did you feel today that have these sensations lingering? And what does that remind you of? Does it show up other places? Is it familiar? Is, is this like something that you've experienced? Can you name, right? That that kind of thing. Like there's all of this movement happening in the body, tension, um, effervescence, kind of the bubbly, the dizzying, all of these things that are 
ways in which we experience ourselves and we just get uncomfortable with it because we don't know what it is. Mm. So we can just be like, oh, this, even when it comes to like panic and anxiety attacks, um, some of the greatest work I've seen done is people who actually get to understand what is happening in the body so that they can actually have some tools to self-regulate. And then the need for um, medication is not as great or or not at all, right? It becomes something that is like, okay, this is, I'm understanding more about myself than ever before. And in a world where so many of us are not getting the pleasure that we deserve, <laughs> um, and, and don't know even what that might look like because we've not had time to truly be in it, right? Like we are in a rush to go to everything for some reason. And so it's like people are even rushing through the, the, good, the good stuff. They're just speeding through the good stuff. And then when the bad stuff comes, and I'm using these judgmental words, but to, to land a point that when the bad stuff comes, then they just get stuck there. And so we end up in this big imbalance of hanging out in the part we don't, a part of life that we don't want to, because we actually don't have the tools to really allow us to experience fully the parts that we do. So we don't hang out there either. That gets real uncomfortable. It gets real, it's real unfamiliar. We don't spend enough time there. And so learning more about our bodies, learning more about the way we look, why it looks like that, what happens when we experience arousal, um, what happens when we experience rejection, how those two things are related. All of that is so integral to us really knowing ourselves sexually. And it may, it makes for better relationships. It makes for better community. Like we are, we're able to actually be in community together longer or better, stronger, because we understand. We're not speaking from a place of hurt all the time or fear. Our nervous system is at driving the truck into like anxiety land all the time. These are the things that we heal from that. So cool. Um, what is, what do you think after years of doing this? I, I count a few decades at least just cause you said you're born in the seventies and you started this work at 19. So I just kind of did some rough math in the decades. I'll say decades that you've been doing this. What is the real universal fear? What is our deepest fear around sex and sexuality that we're carrying that human beings who maybe haven't done this work that are carrying what is the real universal fear our initial wound abandonment that's it we're, uh, we're our biggest fear is that we will not belong somewhere that we will be abandoned that we will be rejected neglected and that's our initial wound i always think from childbirth when we um you know we had nine months or so um, in this like perfect little environment where we didn't have to do anything, food was just coming to us, love and nurturing, and then we're out. And so that's our first trauma and our first experience to let us know that there is that life is life and that it is going, that it is fleeting, right? That there is separation that happens and that that is painful. It does not feel as good as connection. And we carry that, I think, throughout the rest of our lives. And a lot of what we do, how we show up in sex is performative and it's performing for connection. It's performing for um, for a place where we belong. Rather than just belonging or being connected. Exactly. That is so profound, Amina Peterson. That was like, a that's a moment. That is, really right? strikes me. We're performing so that we can have what we most deeply desire, which is the connection or the feeling of belonging rather than just belonging or being connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for people who work with you or attend these retreats and when they start to recognize that pleasure and guilt and shame are all connected to each other, what becomes possible for that individual? Oh, the world opens up. <laughs> and that's my, this is where the joy of my work lives. It's like watching people have that, as Oprah calls, the aha moment. And then looking around, taking inventory and realizing like, oh, I can show up as me. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm even thinking about what you just shared, like the aha moment. It was so in my head what just happened when you talked about performative uh, performative in order to be able to belong or performative in order to be able to connect. And I'm just thinking to myself like, okay, I had an aha, it's in my head, but I can imagine attending your retreat or working with you would allow me to more deeply embody it. Uh, right. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm coming on your retreat at Imaloa. I got to keep a separation of church and state. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, I'm just exploring the idea of people who might be listening, who have had an aha. And then what do you do with that aha? How do you actually begin to embody it? Yeah. And that's why, that's what led to these retreats ultimately, because what was happening is I was doing this coaching and I'm working with people in their bodies and they have the aha moment and they hit the street and they're back out there in the world that's telling them the aha moment was some garbage. They performing, they performing. Right. Yeah. Go right back to performing. Right. Swinging from chandeliers. Like you just want to belong. You don't need to swing from a chandelier. I used to tell my ex. Uh. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And so, so in that, in the retreat setting, that aha moment happens and then you're in a space where you get to like test it and see if, well, if I just do me, if I just show up as I am, does anyone run away from me? Does anyone abandon me here? Am I still able to be in community and connection? Can I still receive love and intimacy? Can I still be touched and touch others? And that is where that shift happens because you do that for four or five days and then you go out in the world and then you're just an evangelist for me. <laughs> That's what really happens. I've done several, I've had several conversations today for the podcast. Just now mm-hmm. is the first time that I've gotten emotional. That is so touching what you just shared. For those of you who are listening, has this started to strike a nerve with you like it has with me? Are you curious about why so many people brag about how much we work? but not necessarily about how much sexual pleasure we have. Are you wanting more, but maybe it's a bit of an edge for you to be able to explore? As you're thinking about that, Amina, as, as, as people who are listening or watching think about that, I mean, I'd love to ask, I mean, I think we got a good idea, but let's go into it. What is that? What does the time at Imaloa look like? What will people kind of gain and experience? And what is the, what is the structure of the days look like share as much as you feel comfortable with but just giving people a sense of what they're walking into if you want to maybe you want it to be a surprise i don't know i haven't been to one of your retreats and yeah no 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 it's fine I, I love sharing um it's kind of it's kind of magical you know so um the first thing i always say is that i create a lot of space for processing because it's a lot it's a lot to land in your lap and look at and um, when I first started, it was like, go, 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 right? Nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, two o'clock. Retreat hosts do- often think that that's what it takes. They think they need to pack it in where more space. And I assume for this kind of work too, you want to create a level of spaciousness. Yes. I want to create a level of spaciousness because I want you to connect. And so the biggest thing is, is this opportunity for connection and you may find a person or you may find a group of people that you feel really safe with to move through processing and to talk and just to share and be, to be held. We do a lot of cuddling. Um, And so, and that's one of the things I love the most is the couches in the heart. I can't wait to have folks just cuddling and holding each other and creating a space of safety and conscious like community on those couches um, in the heart. I'm looking forward to that. We, we start in the morning with, with movement. Um, I teach uh, erotic breath work, which is a way to move through breath to bring an orgasmic energy into the body, which can mean a lot of things. It can mean like, Oh, I, I finally am a, able to experience all the ways that I can feel breath in my body to I'm having a full blown orgasm at eight 30 in the morning from wow. breathing. And- wow. That's six stri- I mean, that's getting your money's worth, but I'm just thinking about the food and how that causes a certain level of, and then you're going to combine with the breath. It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to, yes. I'm going to prepare the team to make sure that they are balanced and centered for this retreat. <laughs> please, please do. Your team is already so, so grounded. So I think they'll be good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and the food, the food is as much a part of that. Yeah. We do um, blindfolded eating and we feed each other. Um, we have exercises, partner, partnered exercises where 
we feed each other and we allow ourselves to move the experience of taste as a part of our sensual reality because it is and um you really know that when you eat somewhere real good like at Eveloa but if you if you're used to just being on the go and grabbing lunch and oh I gotta get breast right and you don't have time to really enjoy that thing that's nourishing you and so um we just slow down Mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing we have um, something that's similar to t- ecstatic dance, but it, it's tantra dance and it's blindfolded. I like taking away one of the senses. Um, and so we do this practice where we all kind of dance together um, and we bump into each other because we're blindfolded and we make space for each other. And what happens is we start to feel each other's energy fields. And then we don't bump into each other by the end of the night. It's the most beautiful thing to wow. watch. It- watching planets in orbit, all dancing and moving and smiling and giggling because they don't know where they're at. So um, that we do that. That's a fun thing that happens. We also, um, I spend some time using some tools from Betty Martin's Will of Consent. And so we do some fun, sexy games that we play with each other, Um, but around coaching, around consent. Again, it's one of those things showing up as who you are means knowing what you really want and feeling safe to say yes to those things and no to whatever's not on that list. And that's not something that we've been brought up in. And so we I teach consent through fun, exploring partner games and where it's completely safe to be like, no, <laughs> and um, completely safe to be like, hell yeah. I want to do this. And so we do, we spend some time doing that. Um, There are uh, conscious erotic touch is a practice of, it's a a somatic sexological body work uh, that I created from years of my work and years of my training. And so I teach that where we move through body work. We have temple nights where we celebrate our bodies. um, And ultimately like you're going to feel good. And it may be the first time in your life that you felt this good for this long. And my intention is that when you leave Imaloa, that you walk out saying, yep, I'm supposed to have more pleasure. Mm -hmm. And that that starts to guide your life. And I promise you, if you're listening to this and thinking, well, why would I do that? It will make your money better. It will make your work easier. You said it will make your money better? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. People, people go to my retreats and a year later I look at them and they are financially solvent. Oh, okay. Interesting. They start, they start saying no to things that are not for them. They stop spending money on things that are performative, right? Like I don't oh, need. Oh, wow. To- so it just links to every area of life. It links to every area in life. Hmm. The wardrobes that some people have because they think that's what they need to belong. They start realizing actually, I don't even like this. I like Eileen Fisher. I don't know why I'm wearing Ann Taylor or whatever the case may be. Um, and so people shift, people experience shifts and, and it's not just the sexual shifts. It shifts every thing we do in life. Cause as we are in small things, we are in all things. And I promise you the thing that you are ruminating over in your life is, is the first, showing up in your sex and vice versa. So my sense of you, especially in this conversation, is that you're grounded and obviously you have the experience and the breadth and the depth and just knowing now where this came from, where this exper- where this um, desire to teach and this, this curriculum really came from and how it was born and how you've nurtured it over the past several decades. I wonder if you pay any mind to this. Do you pay any mind to the stigmas associated with people who learn about this and are like, what the hell is that? Do you pay any mind to that? Does does dealing with the stigma or people's projections or perceptions matter to you at this point in your career? And how do you deal with it? Yeah, at this point, it's it's light work to me. Um, And that only... What does that mean, light work? it's, It's something that's like just very, very... Like, you know, uh, what I think of is the, what is the dandelion when it blows? Like it's, it's frivolous to me okay. because I know that 
Um, and I, I look at it through like the, <laughs> I have this also business brain, right? Cause I spent a lot of time in corporate. And so I'm like, oh, you know, there's these seven touches that you get. So the first touch you're like, oh my gosh, she's a weirdo. And your second touch, some friend probably says something and they're like, you, you go to her class. That's weird. And the third touch you're like, okay, I'm going to class. Or, I don't like this. Or, you know, you move through this and eventually you get to that seventh or that 14th or the 21st, whatever it takes for you touch where you realize that the messaging that you've been getting all your life and are continuing to get is, yeah, it's contra to mine. And, and so you have to navigate that in your own system. Um, and I don't, I don't deal with, I don't deal in the, in the, I don't, that's something that I don't tend to um, in my work because that has to be your journey. And I am not proselytizing that, you you know, sexual wellness. I'm here on the, I'm platforming wholeness. And so you will get to a point possibly after enough exposure to me and people like me, that your sexual wellness is a part of your wholeness. Um, and outside of that, and it's only, I can do that only because I had to do it for myself. And if that part wasn't resolved for me, then I would be tending to that all the time because I'd be trying to work my own stuff out. And that's when it's dangerous in the context of retreats. That what you've just said is exactly where it spirals out of control for folks. That's profound. Yeah. Yeah. That is where it's dangerous. It is because I'm like, I'm trying to get my healing by convincing you that this healing is possible. And that's just not it. I am settling into my wholeness and my juiciness and I love all of it and my mama makes referrals to me and my brother my big brother makes referrals to me so the people that I needed that I was hiding from the most wow. with them being really supportive they're, now they're referring I, people into your business yeah exactly That's and I was beautiful. hiding from them and I was like, oh, just don't look at me. Don't don't find out I'm doing this. And so with that, though, with that love and that connection, that liberated me. Okay. That showed me that like, oh, I can actually just, I don't have, why am I hiding myself to the people that that are that have vowed to love me? My mother has vowed to love me. My my siblings have vowed to love me in this in this familiar relationship. Um even the ones that are like, but I do have some siblings that are like, that's some weird shit you're doing. Excuse me, that's some weird stuff you're doing. <laughs> um, go going over there with that. But uh, but that's still that love and support and connection is there. And so once I was able to realize like that love is available to me as I am, then that battle is behind me. Yeah. And so now I'm just being, and I'm hoping that by being that I can, that's my influencer. Like I'm not a Instagram influencer. I'm a, I'm a living being whole influencer. Like I want to influence you to look at me and people like me and say, I can be whole in that way too. Mm -hmm. You haven't said it, but what becomes possible too, I imagine is the generational healing. The generate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you start healing the up generation, the down generation. I mean, if we're talking about like going to a retreat, investing, you know, money into a retreat with you, what becomes possible when you bring that back to the village, to your own village, wherever that village is in the world? God love you. You're doing God's work in the world, Amina Peterson. This I'm convinced of. This I'm convinced Thanks. of. Um, if you've been listening and you want more information. You can go to imaloainstitute.com slash Amina, A-M-I-N-A. Prices for the retreat start at $3,500. And if you go to the site, uh, imaloainstitute.com slash Amina, um, you can get a complimentary coaching session as part of early bird registration. It's a $500 value, y'all. So you should be going to imaloainstitute.com. You get two. two coaching sessions. Sorry, two yeah. coaching sessions. And I do that for a lot of reasons, but the biggest thing is like, I want people that are coming to you, that are coming to me through, through especially through Imaloa, to like have a chance to work through some of the things that will be in the way of them moving into this experience yeah. before they get there. I think that's imperative. Smart. So it's a bonus. It's like a signing bonus. And it's also nurturing, especially if people are, are, are diving in uh, for the first time. Yeah, cool. The retreat's happening November 6th to 11th, 2023. I'm excited. You brought me through all seven touches in this conversation, Amita Peterson. Thank you. And thank you, Jake. Thanks for having me. I yeah. appreciate it. It's so good. All right. Thanks, honey. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.